the FlashForge Artemis. Or, if you're buying it from FlashForge International, this is indistinguishable, I think, from the FlashForge Finder 3. At least, I couldn't find a difference between these two machines. Now, before I say anything else about this printer, I want to point out that it has been printing constantly, non-stop for me, since I got it. This is almost a workhorse. This machine wants to be 3D printing, and I kind of love that about it. With this machine, I have been printing print-a-block boxes. I have been printing print-a-block sets, including the brand new print-a-block jet engine writer, available directly on 3dpprofessor.com shop, or if you're a Patreon backer at the $3 level or more, you already have this model. You wouldn't begrudge me a little plug, right? I've been printing PLA. I've been printing silk PLA, so much rainbow silk PLA. I gotta say, rainbow silk PLA and these collapsible swords by 3D Print World are my new favorite thing. I should model some of these collapsible swords myself. Yeah. But this machine can also print PETG. It's direct drive, so it can print TPU. It should be able to print ABS, and with a few minor modifications, I'll bet you could make an enclosure as it is, it's an open system, but I think that could happen. And while I might have some nits to pick about this machine, just keep that in mind. It works, and it wants to work, and that's very good. Now, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, you know that the machine to beat is FlashForge's own Adventurer 3. The Adventurer 3 is a machine that I recommend most often. Not because it's, it's the best machine out there, but because I know that without knowing a thing about the person who's asking me for a recommendation, that they will probably have a good experience with the Adventurer 3. That's because the Adventurer 3 is a solid machine with an absolutely buttery smooth user experience. And many of those user experience improvements exist in the Artemis 3D printer as well. In fact, while this is a different line, while this is from the FlashForge Finder line, it seems to me like they've taken a lot of hints from the Adventurer line and put it into this machine. So while I'm sure that FlashForge doesn't want me making a comparison video between this and the Adventurer 3, Quite frankly, that's inevitable, so let's just dive into it. First of all, let's talk about the user interface. One thing that makes the Adventurer 3 so good is that they have a local storage for print files on the machine. That means that whether you're streaming a print to it over Wi-Fi or using the removable media and carrying it over via sneaker web, the file is copied to the local storage before it's printed, meaning that you can mid-print yank the media out to start another print and it won't affect the current print. Try doing that with your Ender 3, or your Prusa, or your Ultimaker, or, or really any 3D printer that you've paid less than a thousand dollars for. It's a remarkable feature that makes these machines just that much more resilient and makes them perfect for schools, libraries, maker spaces, or just a home where you might have children who are impatient and don't think to wait before yanking out the card to start their next print. And that feature is present in the Artemis as well. So big ups for that for the Artemis. Now, one niggle about the Adventurer 3 is that it is a enclosed bed slinger, meaning that a large amount of the internal space has to be used for the movement of the bed, so it's actually a bigger enclosure than it really needs to be for the build volume. But the Artemis is an XY movement system with the bed that just moves up and down, meaning that this enclosure is just form-fitted to the build volume of this machine. In other words, it's not gonna waste your desk space, and that to me is another big plus for the Artemis. Now, the FlashForge's extruder assembly is one that I really like because it is so easy to maintain, even though it does require proprietary parts that you have to buy from FlashForge. Well, 
That's not true of the Artemis. In fact, if that was a sticking point for you, we'll never fear because the extruder assembly on the Artemis is one, a direct drive system and two, built with common parts. It's really easy. I can tell just looking at this, this is the sort of extruder assembly that I've been using since I started 3D printing nearly a decade ago. If the idea of a machine that you can fix, even if the company that makes it goes out of business, appeals to you, then that could be a big plus for the Artemis for you. Another complaint about the Adventure 3 is that you can't level the bed. They set the bed level from the factory and usually, really, that's good enough most of the time. But there is a complaint, hey, if it's not perfect, I can't fix it. Well, you can level the bed on the Artemis. The Artemis has two-point leveling. You heard me right. There are only two knobs for leveling. Now, you might say, but don't we need a third point? You have the third point in software. You tell the software where the bed is and then fine tune it with the knobs. Now, if you're hearing that and that's not making you cringe just a little bit, let me explain why the more experienced printer users are cringing. Three points defines a level. And so regardless of the fact that we only have two knobs to level it, that third point is a part of the level. And if we can only level it in software, then we only have as much change that we can make to that as the software allows. And how much change does the software allow? A tenth of a millimeter. Yeah, that, that's not much. In fact, it's entirely likely that you might try layer heights smaller than that. And FlashForge's solution to that is, well, in the software, their first layer is just a little bit thicker than the rest of them, usually about 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters. And that's fine. It works. In fact, when I finished leveling this for the first time, I did it by printing a 20 millimeter cube that I had stretched out to being the same size as the build plate, but 0.2 millimeters thick, and then did 10 layers around the outside so that I could fine tune the knobs uh, that I could fine tune. If it wasn't sticking on the back, I just had to cancel the print and re-level it in the software manually just by saying, well, last time I did this number, now I'll do a number that's 0.1 higher or lower than it. But once I finally got it, yes, I was able to print the entire bed perfectly level and peel this print off like a giant piece of very satisfying Velveeta cheese. Mm. But while I'm talking about things that aren't perfect, this machine advertises that it has filament out detection. And what's interesting is while it is a direct drive, meaning it's feeding the filament right next to the nozzle, the filament out detection is in the back near where the filament goes in. That means that there is, oh, approximately a meter of, of distance between where the filament runs out before it will actually affect your print. That's not bad. But what I found odd was that the filament out detection was turned off by default in the firmware. So I turned the filament out detector on and started a print that would take a little bit longer than usual. I was printing the collapsible pirate sword by 3D Print World. Absolutely love these collapsible swords. They all print in one piece with all of the little segments printing right next to it so that when you're done, you can stretch it out. But this print paused halfway through saying that it had run out of filament. Now, this happened in the middle of the night while I was sleeping. I woke up, saw that it was only partway through the print and complaining that it was out of filament. But I checked and it wasn't. The filament was fine. It was a false negative. So I told it to go ahead and start the print, and as soon as the nozzle came down to start the print, the print detached and just followed the nozzle around. The print bed had cooled down while it paused, and even though it tried to reheat it to start the print, it was too late. The print had completely detached from the print bed, and there was no salvaging the print. Now, this is frustrating. The print didn't fail because of anything I had done. It didn't fail because I had made a mistake. There was filament in there. The machine made a mistake in reading that and in doing so it cold paused and ruined the print. Now this is something that could be fixed 
in the software. They could really easily just do a retraction and do a hot pause. Do not let the machine cool down. So this might be fixed in future versions. And I've communicated this to FlashForge and hopefully they will fix it. But for now, I guess I understand why they turned off the filament out detection by default. But this raises an interesting question. If you have a feature that you have to turn off because it doesn't actually work, do you really have that feature? Another niggle that I have about this machine is its Wi-Fi. Yes, it does have Wi-Fi and setting up the Wi-Fi is super easy, although a little bit strange. Back to the comparison. On the Adventurer 3, it has a very tiny little screen. And so to get the password into there, if you have letters in your password and it's not just something like your mother's phone number or something, if it is an actual secure password, they only give you half of the alpha keyboard at a time, meaning that you have to type in the letters on the left half, then move to the right half and type in the letters on the right half and then move to the left half and back and forth and back and forth. It's annoying. This machine has a much bigger screen and they're still doing the half a keyboard thing on it. Why? But nevertheless, that's a minor annoyance that once you get past it and you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you can stream prints to this over the Wi-Fi until you can't. Almost every print that I ran on this machine, by the time I finished running the print, the Wi-Fi had lost connectivity, except the machine didn't seem to be aware that it had lost connectivity and it kept pretending like it was connected. It kept saying, yes, this is my IP address. And even if I typed in that IP address in the software, I still couldn't stream a print to it. So the Wi-Fi on it is spotty and I could fix it easy enough. Sometimes I could just go into the settings, turn off the Wi-Fi, turn it back on and I was back into it. But if I need to go to the machine to turn on and off the Wi-Fi or worst case scenario, turn off and on the machine, I might as well just carry prints in the removable media and I lose the advantage of having the Wi-Fi. Now, I should mention that I never had Wi-Fi problems with the Adventure 3. Where I could get it to connect to the Wi-Fi, it stayed connected reliably. And this to me seems like something that they could fix with a firmware update that was just a little bit more aware of the fact that maybe it had lost internet connectivity, time to reconnect. So hopefully that's something that could be and will be fixed in the future. Now, again, I need to mention that this is a machine that I have been 3D printing with since I got it, and it is robust and it wants to 3D print. It's a good 3D printer. These little niggles that I have with it really aren't a big deal if the output that you get is the important part. And if you looked at the Adventure 3 and said, well, yeah, but the Artemis slash Finder 3 answers a lot of those problems. So this may be the machine for you. While you're checking out this cool thing posted by one of you on the What You Making channel on my Discord, why don't you open up the cards and see what deep dive into the topics of this video you can do. Man, this is really cool. Yeah, I really enjoy it when people connect with me on social media. That's why I've got links to all the socials in the description and I hope you'll check them out. I've also got a Patreon which you can check out here and I'll tell you a little secret about the suggested videos. This is the one that YouTube thinks that you'll like. This is the one, though, that I think you'll like. Which one of us is right? Only one way to know for sure. Gotta watch them both. And remember, safety first, because I really do care about you. And see you next time.